Bentornati tutti. Prima di passare la parola Before giving the floor to uh, Gabriella to uh, begin her moderation, I would like to give an announcement about the mass because many people are asking us questions about the mass. For the mass today, which will be at 6:30 p.m., you should uh, try and be there by 4 4:30 p.m. at the latest. And you have to uh, go in 
from the square as you usually do. Go through security checks, you go in to the square, and then you walk towards the altar. So as the program begins for today, uh, a little housekeeping details about this evening's Mass. As we mentioned, the Mass is going to be the highlight not only for today, but of the entire World Median Families. It will be celebrated by Pope Francis this evening in St. Peter's Square. In fact, just a few days ago, the uh, schedule was changed a little bit. The Mass is originally scheduled to begin at 5.15. It's been pushed back to 6.30 this evening, uh, largely because of the weather here in Rome. It can be very, very hot and has been very hot in the past few days. So they've pushed it back uh, about an hour and a little bit in order to escape from some of the worst of the heat of the day. And precisely, that change was made precisely in order to encourage the participation of the faithful in the uh, Mass today. The delegates will have a place. That was the housekeeping details we've been hearing. Uh, they will be, uh, they will have a special uh, seating area set off for them. Uh, However, there will also be uh, the Mass is open to all those here in Rome who want to participate this evening. And now we'll begin and catch up with the opening of this morning's events. So now we will be addressing this beautiful topic chosen by the Holy Father, and which is the holiness that summons every family all over the world. I would like to introduce to you our speakers, Francesco Beltrame Quattrocchi. He is a full professor of bioengineering at the University of Genoa. Since 2013, he has been the president of the National Research Institute and uh, Promotion for Standardization. He's grand officer of uh, the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic since 2013. And he is the adopted son of the Venerable Enrichetta, daughter of Luigi and Maria Beltrame Quattrocchi. And I would like to introduce to you, right from the very beginning, Andrea Bicchiega and Patrizia Marchegiani. They've been married since 2011. And uh, she uh, uh, grew up close to monasteries. And what was uh, uh, essential was uh, the meeting with the blessed uh, uh, Baltrocchi spouses. That was fundamental to them, that which whom they know knew indirectly through their uh, youngest daughter, Enrichetta, and they had uh, the grace of having her as uh, their maid of honor. Patrizia teaches uh, Italian language arts uh, in the public school of uh, their uh, village. Uh, she also has a PhD in, on, between psychology and ethics in addition to her degree on literature. Andrea, he has a degree in political sciences, and he, is, uh, he works, uh, he's a manager working in, uh, an Italian, in a company here in Rome. And Rob Robert is with them, so I would like to give them the floor at this point and wish you all the best for your proceedings. Good morning. If you could please uh, um, show the footage.
Buongiorno. Ecco. Good morning. Well, this video clip basically is the gist of our, our two uh, speeches. So you have seen uh, the uh, footage showing you my adoptive grandparents and also uh, the uh, image of Patrizia, Andrea, and Robert. In that video clip, there was a question, there was an answer, and there is also a piece of news, let's say. A, a, new, a piece of news is conveyed to you. And what I will be reading to you, as the psalm says, uh, the night brings news, uh, but then the day brings the message. So that historical news of that day, uh, that uh, uh, canonization process uh, for, of this family is the certification of something that has happened. Uh, canonizing means uh, also sanctifying means certifying etymologically. Something that is sacred, and sacred means something that uh, basically is a message of, of victory. And the message that I will read also uh, to the benefit of our interpreters, and I will uh, tell you in some way how I have received this message and I will try to convey to you experiences that I have lived uh, myself uh, in the Beltrame Quattrocchi family. Indirectly, I met Maria, but then I met uh, their children. Uh, Luigi and Maria Beltrame Quattrocchi, they lived in Rome in the 1900s. You know, these are their first spouses, the first ones to be uh, beatified as a couple and not individually. In the entire history of the Catholic Church, by Pope Saint, uh, Pope Saint John Paul II here in St. Peter's Square on October 21st, 2001. This is the day of the so-called certification, what I was uh, talking to you uh, about earlier. We are related on my father's side, but then as an adult in 2009, I was adopted by Enriqueta, who is now a venerable, who in this way uh, wanted to give a sign of continuity even on an earthly level to the work uh, carried out by the entire family, trying to convey uh, to uh, everybody, to people uh, coming from different uh, countries and cultures, and convey to them this experience, the experience of the family as a whole. I did not have the opportunity to meet Luigi personally because I was related to him on my father's side because he passed away shortly before I was born. But I can say, and I can tell you that I had the privilege and the gift of having been the eyewitness of what? Of the uh, approach to the lives of Luigi and, Mary and, and Maria sorry, and their works through several decades, ever since I was uh, uh, a, a young boy, like Robert is now. And it's precisely because I had the opportunity to observe them directly. Thus, uh, I uh, feel the duty to open this uh, uh, to the world, this gift. I have received many, but this is very important. I did not want to just keep it to myself. I wanted to share this with all of you. With no educational or didactic uh, intention uh, towards my listeners. The premise uh, that I take for granted, uh, this is in the different interviews uh, that I took part in, and as was the case with the children of Luigi and Maria after their beatification. However, the premise is that these were absolutely normal people. That's important to stress. That basically started a family that was normal, meaning that every day, with their uh, constant consistency of both words, example, and prayer, they were able to help their children to learn how to live, to think, to move forward, in the joy of knowing that they are always loved, even in times of difficulties that were many. They knew that they were always loved by their heavenly father. And uh, they were also aware that they had the possibility to love him beyond every hindrance or whatever event or any passion. Luigi and Maria, uh, they were in their early 20s, and they experienced the arrival of their children as a multiplier, as a multiplier factor of their already very intense bond of love as newlyweds in their 20s. Because as I mentioned the other day, they were amazed by the beauty of the world, and they were amazed by the beauty of their children who were entrusted to them as a gift. It was for them a very clear answer to an important question that we all contemplate. 
what is life, right? And correspondingly, what well, was the best way to go through life, life sorry, in order to uh, uh, really try and do our best to understand our life, and that's not easy to do when you go beyond just scratching the surface, because then you have to be, uh, when you, if you scratch beyond the surface, you have to be willing to also bear the burden of suffering. So they have walked through a century of history with their family and have offered enlightenment by Jesus, to whom they, they always uh, they were always inspired in their behavior. So they offered themselves and their four children a continuous care. They were careful, which I believe this is an important uh, message. And uh, this was care that they always share, but it was always attentive and respectful of the different and strong, I have to say, individual personalities of the members of the family cell, including grandparents. Their family cell was structured biologically like any other living cell. It was aimed at the replication of its own genetic material, of its DNA, is an expression of the vital impetus that biology observes but cannot explain completely. Of course, it was in, endowed with a membrane that identified it as a unicum that protected it from the infiltration of uh, <coughs> potentially harmful agents, but also propelled towards the outside in order to convey the message because the human being and therefore also the family which is a group of human beings is not made to live alone it is not it is a social animal so it's a cell that's able to generate messages and actions capable of listening and of being listened without listening without uh, the mutual ability to listen to each other there can be no dialogue in an ecumenical sense without any kind of bias hence from this specific aspect, well, Luigi and Maria's had a great respect for the hospitality that was extended toward anyone that they met on their way for whatever reason. And uh, it, there are so many memories that I can share with you. As a child, I remember of, uh, uh, as a child is of the presence in the center of the dining room table in their home in Rome in Via de Predis, where I still live, there was a telephone with a cord, right? Back in the day, young people nowadays don't even know how to dial uh, a, a number on a rotary a dial phone. And they had it always there on the table so that they would always be ready to pick up the phone whenever it was ringing to help anyone who needed their help, even when they were eating. So Luigi and Maria identified a, a main goal for them in this constant care in their daily action in order to uh, give a tangible uh, outcome to their love that was where it was very intense when they were young people and which was fueled by this choice. They had a strategic, a long-term vision. They were able to carry out, as John Paul II said, ordinary actions in an extraordinary way. Sometimes during very complex times, such as the two uh, world wars, where they were active players, especially through uh, the actions of, uh, of the children, of their children, which they coordinated. Another uh, the collection, right, the Italian armistice, September 8, 1943, until the end of World War II, here in Rome, until June the 4th in 1944, when uh, General Clark uh, liberated Rome. Uh, the house in Via de Pretis was a safe haven for several dozen politically persecuted Jewish underground dissidents, all kinds of people who were housed one by one, dressed as Benedictines, and provided with authentically forged uh, ID cards. So they were uh, forged in a very realistic way to allow them access to the nearby Termini train station so that they could travel towards southern Italy that had already been liberated by the Allies. Dramatic choices, tragic choices for, for those families and couples and engaged couples. They didn't know whether they would see each other again. So the Beltrami Quattrocchi family cell acted like a cell in a determined and synergistic manner to conduct this high-risk operation. Bear in mind that uh, the high German command was headquartered right at the Viminale, basically a building that's adjacent to the house in Via dei Pretis. 
I, uh, personally speaking, considering the fact that they were all very determined and, and high energy people in every respect, I always considered such an operation as a spontaneous act of great generosity towards others. Uh, you know, that the child of their own, basically the result of the way their family was. But instead, in 2012, I was informed by the Italian state police that this was not just a spontaneous and an episodic operation. It was a coordinated uh, operation with the, the uh, allied intelligence services. I was given copies uh, of uh, documents from the Office of Strategic Services from the USA, which later became the CIA. And I received also military service records of Father D'Arcisio and Father Paulino. And these documents officially attest that the two Benedictine brothers, in close coordination with the monastery and the municipality of Subiaco, from where the original cassocks and ID cards uh, came originally, that were forged in an authentic way in order to feed the system of late vocations that was devised by then uh, Abbot Caronti, whom I met in Parma. Well, so the abbot who welcomed them in Parma, Abbot Caronti, he was the one who, networking with them and the Vatican and the Allies, was able to complete this operation. So basically, they were uh, secret agents from the Allied forces, Father Tarcisio in Rome as head of uh, the uh, Travertine gang, uh, who, whoever comes from Rome knows how many people died and what the Travertine gang was. This was uh, an espionage operation uh, regarding the position of the German uh, artillery. And even more dangerous, uh, Father Paulino in Parma, he was the head of the Nemo network in occupied territory. Luigi and Maria, they knew about this, and they were able, in a very calm way, they were able to uh, handle and supervise and keep everything under wraps with great courage and very wise discretion, always trusting in Jesus, to whom they always asked support. After all, they could not really oppose these things, even if they could have spared their family all this, because what was happening in their home was the ripe fruit of their parental care that I mentioned earlier. So they had basically raised their children in this way so that they would do these kinds of things. And so it would have been a contradiction to prevent their children from doing this. Another interesting recollection that is worth mentioning is uh, this is a, a, a prior recollection, dates back to 1924. When the vocations of uh, the uh, two sons basically emerged independently, Filippo, Father Tarcisio, and Cesare, Father Paulino, what happened? Well, uh, the father was a well-known character. He was deputy advocate general of the state, and friends uh, showed up at their home, and their friends started giving them advice. And this advice was, oh, well, you should send your boys to the Gregorian University so indeed, there will be a wonderful uh, career in the church. They will can become monsignors, bishops, uh, and who knows, maybe cardinals. And, and Luigi, uh, who was a very uh, sober uh, man and well balanced, uh, he uh, basically told, told uh, Cesare and Filippo, listen, if you want to pursue a career, I'm here to help you. You can go to the university. You can do whatever you want. You have to choose freely. However, instead, if you choose to become priests, you have to promise me that you will always be just simple priests, because God's calling, if it is authentic, is completely different. It's a different thing than, uh, than pursuing a career. This message was very, very clear. And uh, the sons uh, uh, heeded uh, this uh, piece of advice. And they never betrayed the promise that they made their father. 
Of course, they were self-assured. They were could, they were assertive. And they wanted to speak their mind to anyone, to cardinals or popes, but not because they wanted to pursue their own career in the church. And I think that this is an important miracle that deserves to be mentioned. It's a kind of miracle in a way. Another interesting thing, which might be indicated as an example, now it could be done with tweets and uh, engaged couples uh, exchange tweets with the social media. Media, Lu Luigi and Maria you used to exchange many, many passionate uh, letters when they were younger. Uh, this could be done only by writing traditional letters, and we ha still have them. Love letters between them and also the letters they sent to their children. They were all collected and published. They exchanged these messages, and this goes to show that there was a path of communion, of uh, gradual and progressive harmony, that if we wanted to, uh, let's say, portray this uh, using a pentagram in, in, as a music score, we might say that these two youngsters basically uh, tuned their uh, instruments, and then they had uh, played a prelude of their love that was very intense. Uh, Luigi would write, uh, oh, I would like to kiss you everywhere. And Maria would reply, they would write in English, in French, in order, uh, you know, they would not be caught by their respective parents, especially Maria. And then after this prelude, they started playing a symphony, right, in the etymological sense of the term. When they got married, to do what? In order to then uh, start climbing up the hill, which was their life. And the same care uh, that I mentioned earlier is found in the letters to their children. And here, too, there is a beautiful example of, of death and how careful they were to their vocations. They did not impose a family model. None of their children followed their model. They have uh, um, made up families of families in a synopitic way. So there was no imposition. They made free choices that were different. An example of death of the same care of, the, of Maria's mother in a letter of 1926. And she uh, replies to the children who had found themselves uh, in this monastery. I don't know if you know Parma. Parma, compared to Rome, is very cold. They were used to uh, being served and uh, treated quite well in Via de Pretis. They found themselves uh, the cold, peeling potatoes. And they were grumbling and saying, who knows, maybe some of their superiors were not uh, really a perfect example of holiness, right, their superiors. And Maria uh, left us a, a gem as a mother in an in enlightening and uh, unequivocal way. She said, uh, my dear so sons, remember that you are there in order to sanctify yourselves and not to judge other people's holiness. This, too, is a fundamental message, I think. Luigi and Maria knew uh, the value of writing, both because it was an accurate way to convey in a pondered way a message that was not just superficial regarding a specific event in a historical moment, but also to leave a memory of this in the long run of what? Of the constant care of their family self, aware that at some point they, uh, their earthly life would come to an end, and they wanted to lead this message for posterity. We can say that they were able to implement a long-term plan, uh, implementing, uh, let's say, uh, a model that is, is easy uh, to replicate, that's simple, and can be expressed according to different cultures, also different uh, mindsets. In this sense, the innovative and historical fact of having been committed as builders, constant builders of a model of family cell guided by Jesus, capable of being in dialogue with all other family units, even the ones that were very different from their model. Why? Because they wanted to make the beauty of people in dialogue with each other and with nature accessible to all. The aesthetics, aesthetic in Greek means feeling, and also to uh, then appreciate with fullness the value of the gift of life. They also knew quite well that all things change and that all things 
are renewed. And so through uh, this renewal, they were always able to uh, preserve uh, the precious original value that was given to them. So their challenge uh, right, of uh, uh, loving each other through that small cell that the family is, this can be taken up and pursued for the sake of the world to come, together with the determination to humbly seek and renew another feature they had, a trait. Every day, their great trust in uh, uh, Jesus' plan every day, a Hail Mary and Our Father, a short prayer. They, they knew that the Lord knew what to give them, but they knew that the Lord wants us to renew our requests every day. We must emphasize the fact that everything that I'm saying is not just well, si simple and accessible. I like to use the way usable if you read this model, basically. And this uh, video clip continues with another example a few decades later to show that this can be used because the family cell here of Andrea and Patrizia, who had the opportunity in some way of receiving the baton from or the torch from Luigi and Maria and will t tell you about their experience, is only the proof of what I've said and which happened a few decades later. But what has been set in motion by them basically led to uh, the development of guidelines in a way. And without guidelines, there could not be sanctification because you cannot certify something if there is no standard with respect to which something has to be certified. Uh, what is this guideline? It has to be universal guideline, as open as possible, in order to point to a path that can be uh, followed and which generates holiness with continuity uh, and taking care on a 360-degree radius of your family. And I believe that this is one of the essential secrets for a happy life or, or anyhow, a bearable life uh, if we scratch beyond the surface and we encounter tragedies and pain. And so this is a recipe for a happy life for people, a positive message, not saying that the family is destroyed and needs to be rebuilt. Yes. We acknowledge this, but we have to start with a positive message. And this is the positive message of this footage, and this is the testimony that now Patricia will bring to you. Thank you. Good day. We didn't meet them, uh, blessed uh, Luigi and Maria Patrocchi, they both died uh, when we were not born yet. Uh, the last uh, today was Maria in uh, 66. Uh, however, we can say that they encouraged us uh, uh, to really push us uh, to the sacrament of marriage uh, uh, through the uh, who uh, we met and uh, have known very well, and we had the grace to have as our uh, best woman at our wedding. And then I are very different by temperament, but also by uh, formation and background. Uh, I grew up in the shadow of bell towers, especially those of monasteries and hermitage. Andrea, well, let's say a little less. And for this reason, after years uh, more or less of stormy engagement, we needed some time before we got a little closer and get more harmonized. Having now reached the threshold of marriage, I was uh, seized by a thousand doubts and fears I was confused and I found myself a bit stuck. So we went together on pilgrimage to the tomb of Beltrame Quattrocchi, blessed to whom my father was devoted. He always kept a picture of them in his purse to ask for uh, light and discernment. And on our return from that pilgrimage, with a hint of daring, we dared to knock at the door on the door of the apartment in Via de Preti's Rome the house in which the blessed couple had lived and where their last child, Enriqueta, was still living at the time. 
transmitting and enduring their message, but also climate and witnessing. We dedicate that that house, and has it always been with our fans, continue to be extraordinary and unconditionally open to anyone, along with the hearts of those who inhabited it. There, in that apartment, uh, we had a clear evidence that marriage is a path to holiness. Well, we, of course, uh, knew it before, certainly. In theory, in abstract, the statement had been uh, echoed dozens of times in catechesis, in the premarital course, in the parish. But uh, this truth uh, that sounded great, I liked it. Uh, well, it seemed quite difficult to, to implement. How could I combine God's absolute, God's supremacy, uh, the God's alone suffices, square and nothing to put before God's love that I tasted a little, uh, thanks to my monk friends, with the hectic life of a family. And then even more difficult, how could we do it with a husband uh, that uh, family? And then even more difficult, how could we do it with a husband uh, that uh, uh, had little experience of that monastic thirst for the absolute, which had attracted me so much? In short, it seemed to me that married life, far from leading us to the center of our existences around the unicum, would, on the contrary, disperse and disintegrate them in the myriad of problems thoughts, commitment, races, uh, schedules, and the daily living of a family, especially today, and especially in a chaotic city like Rome. In that Roman house uh, on Via de Pretis, on the other hand, uh, it was uh, glaringly obvious that Marta and Maria could live, uh, uh, coexist, intertwine, harmonize, merge, and blend together without any opposition. Perhaps it, it was that Enriqueta there in that apartment to continue to bring to life what some John Paul II said of his mother on the day of her beatification. By her deep interior life, in a simple, ordinary life, she looked to that one center from which to draw vigor of cohesion. Or perhaps it was that there in everything, in the most mundane, an everyday thing among crockers, a table, kitchen, the objects of daily life of the blessed, still in use by Enriqueta. You could perceive the depth of faith with which everything was looked at and enjoyed. And in conversation with Enriqueta, uh, I felt dizzy. Perhaps it was what Maria called fidelity in the least that shone through its uh, ordinariness. The house was quite ordinary. It became a sort of plastic representation of it. Or perhaps it was Enriqueta herself <laughs> who continually forced us to raise our gaze on things, to look at them from the roof upwards. Another motto of Beltrame Quattrocchi, spirituality seeking God's point of view. Perhaps it was uh, the naturalness with which there, sitting around the table, we passed quietly from macaroni and sauce to rosary. Moreover, pray by Riqueta with a mystical intensity. It was that warm family welcome that embraced anyone who entered that apartment, and that not even Riqueta's illness even in its terminal stages, when she was now bedridden, managed in the least to undermine. We could also tell you how Enriqueta knew how to listen deeply, far beyond words, the sign of a well-established habit in the family. And if there was a need, and with us there was. Moreover, at that time for her, between advanced age and illness, she was uh, really sick, and she exhorted us, one must have great respect for events because they are either God's will or at any rate they are permissible. And she told us that uh, when asked uh, what was the secret of her parents' holiness, she replied that it resided simply in trying to do 
in everything God's will. will. In short, we cannot specify it any further, but the evidence was that uh, it imposed itself. God had everyday life there in that flat, where in everything deeply intertwined with each other, interwoven so much that the blessed Mary wrote about her relationship with her husband in the booklet, The Warp and the Weft, the booklet rumor that we gave as wedding uh, favors at our wedding can also be said of that family's daily life with the Lord. You realize that the weft is thread by thread, depending on the warp. You realize that he was the basis and supporting of everything, the inspiration of every good, every activity, every desire. After marriage, uh, we wanted from the very beginning to give fullness to our family with children. But although we had performed all medical checks at the Germania Hospital, and they assured that everything was fine for both of us, the children were not coming, months, months, and years, but no pregnancy. And in the meantime, we had advice, pressure from friends, colleagues. Uh, the solution for them was one artificial insemination. But even here, the example of the Quattrocchi family came back to enlighten us and show another way. We knew very well that Enriqueta had been able to be there to accompany us to the wedding because her parents, uh, almost 100 years earlier, Enriqueta died when she was 98, decided not to abort her despite strong pressure from the doctors. Maria's pregnancy, in fact, was strongly at risk, and according to clinical forecast, if she had not aborted as soon as possible, she would have been practically died a death. Both would have died. To see, save at least mother's life, it was absolutely necessary to terminate her pregnancy without any delay, and in fact, uh, um, without any delay uh, for our blessed ones. But it, it, it was uh, just uh, the opposite. They agreed to uh, entrust everything to the providence, and we know that everything turned out well. Pregnancy proceeded well for mother and daughter, uh, despite anxiety and trepidation. Enrica was born sound, safe and sound, and she lived almost a century, becoming the support during her adult, their old age. Therefore, we decided to entrust ourselves to Providence and uh, we opened ourselves to adoption. We have been parents of uh, the most wonderful child we could have ever wished. Now he's uh, a teenager, almost a teenager. And uh, every day our hearts overflow with love. Uh, is, everything is so tender. I would never trade him for any other child in the world, be it a prince, a king, an emperor, a genius, or a biological child. It's son who has realized Jesus. Whoever welcomes one of these little ones welcomes me. A while that, as a promise, has continuously accompanied us, especially in the last stages of the adoption process. So, time is short. Uh, we uh, wanted uh, to tell you that uh, uh, in bringing up our child, we tried uh, to follow the indication of uh, uh, Blessed Maria looking the world from the roof upwards because we everything, you know, music, going to the swimming pool, um, everything is uh, sometimes uh, distracting us, uh, but we have to look uh, from the roof upwards uh, to spirituality. This is one of the motto of the Beltrami Quattrocchi family, and we're trying to implement it also with our son. Thank you. Hallelujah. That was our first conference, uh, introduced by Francesco Votrame Quattrocchi, and then we had intervention by Andrea Bichiega and Patrizia Marchigiani to start off the content for this morning. 
We are now going to have a thank you, thank you for this uh, panel on paths to holiness. Very great testimony to all of you, to the four of you. Now we have a short break, so that uh, we can have the new panelists coming. So we have the morning panelists and moderators who have to join the stage. Come to the stage, please. Do come to the stage. And then, uh, as you heard there, they are taking a very brief pause as they rearrange the stage to accommodate the panel members. As we mentioned, uh, the uh, new panel, which we will hear speaking on the topic of paths to holiness, will involve couples from the United States, Paraguay, Indonesia, and Australia, addressing topics including discernment in daily family life, spiritual accompaniment for new unions, when a spouse is an unbeliever, and forgiveness as the way of holiness. So we will be returning to the floor here in a moment. As we mentioned, uh, the main event here in Rome is also uh, part of the larger World Meeting of Families, which is taking place throughout the world in a diffused manner uh, this year and this, uh, this edition. And that's precisely to make uh, the World Meeting of Families accessible to people around the world. And many people uh, perhaps not able to travel to a foreign city for the uh, traditional world meeting of families. Uh, the last one was held in Dublin, and uh, this way we are able to have a uh, central event here in Rome with participation of people from around the world, but then in the various uh, dioceses and parishes uh, throughout the church, uh, there's opportunities for people that are a little closer to home, so we can expect and hope for a very wide participation in this week's events. The theme of this year's World Meeting of Families, chosen by Pope Francis, is Family Love, a Vocation and Path to Holiness. And over the course of the last three days of the conferences and panel discussions, each day has focused on one aspect of that theme, beginning with family love. Yesterday, speaking on vocation, and today, uh, focusing on the topic and theme of way or path to holiness. And the stage is being set up. The, the four couples who are speaking along with the presenters are making their way to the stage. And they've also, they're also providing uh, additional seats for family members of the presenters. So just a few more moments and we will be able to return you to the program with the panel uh, Discussing Paths to Holiness. That panel is going to be moderated by Laura and Alessandro Tecchini. Just a word of reminder, we will be broadcasting this evening's concluding Mass celebrated by Pope Francis 
live. That will begin just a little before the uh, start time for the liturgy. The Mass begins at 6.30, so uh, we do invite you to tune in a little bit early, uh, perhaps 5-10 minutes early, to see the beginning of the Mass and the procession. That Mass will have live commentary in English. Now we return you to the World Meeting of Families in the Paul VI Hall here in Rome. Bene, riprendiamo i nostri lavori. So we resume the uh, session. Please uh, go back to your seats so that we can start. Allora, so I would like to introduce the moderators of the next panel. The only panel we have for the morning session, Laura and Alessandro Tacchini. Grazie, sedetevi. Allora, sono Laura and Alessandro Tacchini, as I said, were born both in Rome, but have been married for 12 years and uh, parents of Letizia and Edoardo, six and two years of age. Alessandro works uh, as a chartered accountant in an uh, office in Rome. Laura is a journalist. Uh, they have been uh, a part of Rinnovamento dello Spirito Santo Association in Rome, and they also had institutional uh, charges. Uh, Alessandro is a director for the Lazio region and Laura is um, working as director of the social communication office for the catechesis in Rome. They are in love with uh, Jesus at uh, the service of the church and their motto is uh, Jesus is the Lord. Alleluia. They have the floor. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the kind introduction. It is a great honor for us to have been invited as moderators of such a prestigious panel on uh, uh, the path to holiness. It was uh, repeated over and over, and we heard it also in the previous uh, uh, presentation. Spouses and families are called uh, to holiness uh, to, in their daily life with house chores, work, uh, a bringing of children, joy, and uh, troubles. Uh, but Jesus, as in the Nazareth family, can make everything possible and turn our families as the best chance for change and uh, conversion of the world. And therefore, the 10th uh, World Congress of Families is an opportunity to remember that families are alive. With Alessandro, we would like to give testimony of uh, the protagonism of the Holy Spirit in our life. Uh, we have encountered a lot of difficulties, and we're sure that many others will come. But when you keep yourself hand in hand uh, and you look at each other with a promise in your eyes, you can overcome any challenge. We find the courage in prayer that can generate a holy, good, uh, a happy life. <laughs> There are fundamental elements that can help us, and this is something we will discuss with our speakers, discernment, uh, spiritual accompaniment, uh, and uh, forgiveness. Uh, that is very important. And therefore, we would like to start with the first uh, uh, speakers, uh, discernment in family daily life. Uh, from the United States, we have here with us uh, Soren and Ever Elizabeth Johnson. Married for 20 years and parents of five kids. Uh, spouses uh, Johnson have set up uh, the Trinity House Communities uh, Association, is a non profit organization uh, that makes uh, homes a uh, sort of paradise. Uh, uh, Soren and Ever, you have the floor. Our sincere thanks to the dicastery 
for inviting us to speak on the topic of discernment in daily family life. On this feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, it is wonderful to be here with you together with our five children. Three years ago, this past spring, my wife and I felt besieged by life. For a year, I had been in and out of the hospital with life-threatening emergencies and major surgeries. And during that year, we also experienced the sudden death of my dad, and then the loss of my job. Our five children were still at home, and we knew that we urgently needed to discern our next step. At that time, we thought back to the days before we met, when we would go on long retreats in order to better hear God's voice. Now, in our home, we were surrounded by grief and uncertainty, along with the clamor of constant needs. For so many families today, this experience of crisis upon crisis is normal. And it seems it will be impossible to find the narrow path to heaven when we are surrounded by illness, death, economic instability, aggressive nihilism, and even all-out war. How can authentic discernment take place today, given how families are overwhelmed, exhausted, anxious, distracted, wounded, and broken? We have to take a few steps to answer such a big question. We'll start by asking three smaller questions that will uncover the heart of the answer, the core principle we can use for discernment. And then we will show how this principle can shape every level of family life. So to start, the first three questions are, number one, what is discernment and what is it for? Number two, what is our unfailing aid in discernment? And third, is family life a distraction to discernment? So taking that first question, what is discernment and what is it for? Discernment, our Holy Father Pope Francis says, is paying attention to the voices that reach our hearts, always asking where they come from. Then discernment compels us, he says, to ask for the grace to recognize and follow the voice of the Good Shepherd. For parents who long for the quiet of a good retreat, recognizing the Lord's still small voice in the midst of family life may seem impossible. In reflecting on the reality of caring for children while enduring crisis upon crisis, we can see that in some ways, discerning itself is secondary to being in an atmosphere in which discernment is even possible. So we may need to move beyond the question of discernment and focus instead on how realistically we can create an atmosphere for it in our daily life. And as we make that attempt, let's remember what discernment is for. Learning to follow the Lord's voice helps us lead our families heavenward. Ah, heaven, now things are getting interesting. There is nothing more in the whole of life that we want so much as heaven. At times, we just want to leave our heap of crises behind, fly to heaven, and dwell forever together with our loved ones, with our blessed mother, the saints, and above all, with our loving Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But instead, the path looks long and full of confusing decision points. Will we make it to this much hoped for life with God? So, discernment is following God's voice, and discernment is for finding our way to heaven, to life in the Trinity. So now let's move on to our second question. That second question is, what is our unfailing aid in discernment? When we are troubled by doubts about how to find our way, First, we need to remember that Jesus said, I am the way. So what we are faced with is not so much the need to interpret a long, confusing path as it is the need to cling to Jesus as he guides us along it. 
Sometimes we may feel that we cannot hear his voice, that he is too far ahead, that we are getting lost and left behind. But we must calm ourselves and remember that Jesus gave us an unfailing aid that allows us to keep pace with him, the Eucharist. And on this very practical reality, Jesus present in the Eucharist, we can begin to build that atmosphere for discernment in our daily family life. When we cling to the Eucharist, Jesus, our way to heaven, what is the deeper reality? The deeper reality is that our souls are already in communion with God, that he is dwelling in us and we in him, that the deepest part of us, that the deepest part of us leaps over the long confusing path and inhabits heaven already. So, given what discernment is, what it's for, and our unfailing aid in it, let's ask the third question. The third question, is daily family life a distraction to discernment? How do we bring our peaceful communion with Jesus into our noisy family so that we will be able to hear his voice and lead them to heaven? This is where we can all breathe a big sigh of relief because families are already much closer to heaven than we might think. The truth hidden in plain sight is that the family and the Holy Trinity share a stunning similarity. Both are a communion of persons by virtue of the love they share. Our families, made in the image of God, are icons of the Trinity. The Christian family, the Catechism declares, is a communion of persons, a sign and image of the communion of the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. Rather than being distant, the dynamics of life in heaven already belong to every family. Now, at this point, the parents of young children may be thinking, that's nice, theoretically, but I wish my kids would act like an image of God now. So now we have arrived back at the real challenge. On the one hand, we have renewed hope because we know that our families are an image of God, a taste of heaven in our homes. But we may also be discouraged because our families have such a long way to go. Rather than being discouraged, let us recall our Savior's words, do not be afraid. Now we will share how we can bring heaven down to earth, how we can weave our communion with God into daily family life, our family's communion in action, in order to create a real life atmosphere for discernment. So, we have encouraging news. As Soren just shared, thankfully, our families are not a distraction for good discernment. Discernment does not require an escape from family life, a sabbatical from marriage, or a timeout from parenting. By being our very own image of God dwelling in our homes, our families are both our way to heaven and our present taste of it. Yes, heaven, life with God, can be tasted in our homes. We as parents can courageously build a loving, immersive Catholic household, a vibrant little society of daily life that allows each family member to follow the Lord's voice into full communion with him and others. But what are the practical steps to do that? And to answer that, we'd like to reflect with you on three more questions. The first one is, what is the principle at the heart of authentic discernment? Question number two, how does communion shape every level of family life? And finally, number three, what are some moments in family life where the principle of communion helps us discern? So the first question, what is the principle at the heart of authentic discernment? Simply put, the principle at the heart of authentic discernment in family life is communion. Why? Because the purpose of discernment is to prepare to live with God. And living with God means living in communion. 
because God's life is one of mutual giving between the Father and the Son, which brings about a creative, fruitful communion in the Holy Spirit. Our families are created both as an image of that communion and as a path to grow in it. So we must evaluate our choices according to this mystical reality. Of any decision our family faces, we can ask, what is the likely result of this? Will the likely result of this decision strengthen or weaken our communion? It is important to recall that communion comes about through attention to both the development of the person and the common good. With both, we can have mutuality, a healthy giving and receiving that strengthens family bonds. So with this principle of communion in mind, let's turn to the second question. And the second question is, how does communion shape every level of family life? If communion is the principle for every decision, how does something so seemingly abstract translate into our intense and sometimes chaotic family life? In raising our children in what we call our Trinity House, We've come to see five interdependent levels of family life. Each is founded on markers that strengthen communion in both the times and places of daily life. In level one of our Trinity House, faith life, we receive our communion. We orient our time on communion by keeping a holy Sabbath which deepens the communion that God gives us in the Eucharist for the week ahead. And we keep our home focused on that communion by tending our home altar, which physically calls us back to communion with God and each other in prayer throughout the week. In level two, person and relationships, we strengthen our communion by developing other-centered people, and relationships. We keep our time oriented on communion by observing a weekly date night. And we also seek out quiet places like a walk, a car ride, or a tuck-in to connect with each family member. In level three of our Trinity House, household economy, we care for our communion. We hold a weekly life meeting between spouses where we organize and commit to the work of the household. And well-kept workspaces physically support our communion so that we can effectively lead our children in shared work and studies. In level four, family culture, we celebrate our communion first with a daily family meal, a mini Sabbath, and by keeping a beautiful family table. In level five of our Trinity House, hospitality and service, we share our communion, our taste of heaven with others, first by being faithful to one outreach at a time, and also by focusing on our neighborhood, which includes our parish. These core markers in time and place are just the beginnings of an atmosphere of communion, but they immediately make staying on the path to heaven easier. Because our families have received communion from God in the Eucharist and prayer, we can then strengthen, care for, celebrate, and share this communion as we journey to heaven together becoming ever more an image of the Most Holy Trinity. So the third and final question, what are some actual moments in family life when the principle of communion helps us discern? Each of us makes countless small decisions every day. Should I exercise now or help my son with his homework? Should I develop myself to be what God has called me to be or is it time for me to serve my family in a way that develops them and deepens our communion? As we seek to answer these questions, we recall that the principle of communion preserves a delicate tension between each person's de development and their contribution to the family. If we make small decisions faithfully 
allocating our resources prudently among persons and the common good, then when we come to medium-sized decisions, like whether to let our daughter play another season of soccer, it will be easier to discern. In such a home, marked by growth and accompaniment, the family members are constantly opting to give each other the gift of time or to spend time together. Yes, our Holy Father notes that sometimes the plates fly, and when they do, we seek forgiveness, pick up the pieces, and resume growing our communion. If we use the principle of communion at life's small and medium junctures, we will be ready when we arrive at big intersections, when we must decide whether to move to another town or take a new job, or how to care for an elderly parent or a son who has just been released from rehab or prison. Immersed in an atmosphere of other-centered communion, the family members turn to the Lord with their daily decisions and they hear his voice in the voice of another, in the events of the day, in prayer and in his word. In conclusion, discernment that leads to greater communion with God and others is an invitation that our Lord makes to every family today, even those who feel their life is crisis upon crisis. If it is true, as Pope St. John Paul II said, that the future of humanity passes by way of the family, then the future will also pass by the way of each family's daily discernment as a little trinity, a communion of persons. As our Holy Father Pope Francis says, in families, there is always, always the cross. But, he continues, the love of God also opened for us this path. After the cross, there is resurrection. So despite the difficulties of family life, we can still cling to communion, to Jesus in the Eucharist. We can discover this principle at the heart of authentic discernment and allow it to shape every level of family life. In the gift of communion that continually comes to us from the heart of the Most Holy Trinity, may our families, calling on our Blessed Mother's intercession, step forward confidently on this path to holiness in family life. Thank you. We should all thank uh, the Johnsons. Thank you for having emphasized the importance of family discernment as a, a fundamental tool that we have to teach our families nowadays. And it can be helpful to guide with prudence and wisdom the choices that we need to make throughout our lives. And now, from the United States, we move to Paraguay with Stella and Victor Dominguez. They've been married for 46 years. They have six children children and eight grandchildren. For the longest time, they've been active in uh, family pastoral care and the preparation of engaged couples for marriage, and currently they coordinate the accompaniment service of, uh, for couples in crisis, and they devote their energies uh, to the strengthening of marriage in different parts of Chile and Argentina. Silla and Victor will uh, talk about uh, spiritual accompaniment for new couples, new unions, and other uh, fundamental instrument and an extraordinary opportunity that allows couples to find listening, understanding, and the strength to move forward with the hope and confidence that only the Word of God can provide. Stella and Victor, and I would like to give you the floor. Muy buenos días, queridos hermanos. Good morning. Good morning. Dear brothers and sisters, it is a great pleasure and a privilege for us to be here with all of you. We are very grateful to God, our Father, for the gift of being able to be here with you and share with you something that really uh, we are passionate about, that moves us and prompts us to move forward, which is love and family. 
Hablando de familia, queremos presentarle This is our treasure, something that we are proud of. Six children, eight grandchildren, we're 20 people, four in-laws. Our family is made up by 20 people overall. Le presentamos la pastoral de la esperanza. We would like to uh, talk to you about a project that's called uh, Pastoral de la Esperanza. And this is a, 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 an initiative that started in Paraguay 16 years ago. And it was introduced in order to uh, provide a spiritual uh, accompaniment uh, to uh, divorced uh, couples and remarried couples. Our pastoral care we also call a balm to the wounds. Let us see now what are the foundations of our uh, Pastoral de la Esperanza. The first pillar is the church, a welcoming church for all his children as Evangelii Gaudium states at number 169. The church will have to initiate uh, brothers and sisters, priests, religious and lay people in this art of accompaniment so that all may always learn to take off their sandals before the sacred ground of the other. We can read this uh, in uh, Exodus 3.5. Uh, the divorced and divorced in new uh, unions must know and experience that the church loves them, is not distant from them, and suffers for their situation. And divorced uh, uh, in new unions are and remain members of the church because they have received their baptism and they still uh, preserve their Christian faith. John Paul II uh, stated this in Familiaris Consortio at number Therefore, we believe that the pastoral love of the church towards this couple has to be felt, has to be made visible, not only in announcements and speeches uh, or nice words, but with tangible actions. This means that uh, the divorced uh, couples in new unions have to feel this love of the church. It is not enough that they know that the church loves them. They have to feel this. They have to feel this love. A love that is not lived or experienced, it's not true love. La Pastoral de la Esperanza tiene como The main aim of the Pastoral de la Esperanza is to welcome, uh, give shelter and support to our Catholic brothers and sisters so that they may experience the infinite love and mercy of God. To accompany them to live united to Christ, participating in the activities of the church. In other words, we need to reintegrate uh, these individuals if they have moved away. They need to be uh, reinvolved and re they have to be reengaged and brought back to the bosom of the church and rehabilitate them in the service to God and to their neighbors because as baptized they have rights and obligations. And this is the uh, charisma that characterizes this group. And we'd like to help them to experience God's healing forgiveness. We want to accompany them in their spiritual, spousal, and family strengthening. Let's see the, the spirit of this pastoral care. The Pastoral de la Esperanza wants to show the divorced individuals who are in new unions, who are brothers and sisters, that they are as much children of God as before uh, their breakup that the smallness known and recognized opens new paths for spiritual growth. We accompany them with love and hope. We accompany all those who have suffered due to a definitive separation and have made the decision to uh, then uh, establish a new home. With them, therefore, we exercise charity in truth, love in truth. Like Jesus, we welcome them in from the truth and the merciful love of God with respect and warmth. We do not promise them anything that is not allowed. 
And we're always very clear on this. We always behave accordingly. What is our methodology? In chapter, chapter 8 of Amoris Letizia, the Holy Father uh, basically uh, points the way to follow using three very simple word, verbs, which are accompany, discern, and integrate. These are the three verbs that we might you, we need we need to use, sorry, in order to behave in the best possible way. So accompaniment, first of all. What is accompaniment? It's God. It's the God of love who reaches out to the fallen man. In Amoris Litzia, at number 291, we can read, the church understands that every rupture of the marriage bond goes against God's will. But she's also aware of the fragility of many of her children, enlightened by the gaze of Jesus Christ. The church looks with love on those who participate in her life in an incomplete way, recognizing that God's grace is also at works in their lives. At number 243, we can read instead to make them feel that they are part of the church, that they are not excommunicated and are not treated as such because they're always part of the communion of the church. These situations require attentive accompaniment with great respect, promoting their participation in the life of the community. Taking care of them does not imply a weakening of their faith, of their witness to the indissolubility of marriage. Actually, they are the most steadfast defenders of marriage. El discernir. En el 290, discerning, so discernment. Number 296, Amoris Letizia, the Pope states, the way of the church is that of uh, condemning no one forever and uh, spreading God's mercy to all persons who ask for it with a sincere heart. For uh, true love is always unmerited, unconditional, and gratuitous. Therefore, we must avoid judgments that do not take into account the complexity of the different situations. And we need to be attentive to the way people live and especially how they suffer because of their situation. Integrate. Jesus chooses us all. Amoris Leticia in the 308 tells us that in order to accompany with mercy and patience the stages of growth that are built day by day, giving place to the Lord's mercy that stimulates us to do the possible good, that's the way to follow. Jesus Christ wants a church that is attentive to what is good that the spirit pours out in the midst of fragility. That is, a mother who at the same time, she expresses clearly her objective teaching, does not give up uh, what, the good that is possible, but it does so by coming into contact with the concrete existence of the brothers and sisters and uh, knowing the power of tenderness. So when we do this as well, life always becomes uh, wonderfully complicated for us. So what do we offer them? First of all, we help them a welcoming, uh, open arms approach. Uh, these people uh, feel accepted, uh, cuddled, cherished. It is the mother church who receives uh, these individuals. So we help them recognize what their rights and duties are within the church. We organize uh, uh, encounters or meetings of formation, uh, also masses and uh, spiritual retreats that are aimed to give them the possibility to receive a spiritual assistance and formation and where they can work with love and hope in order to strengthen their Christian faith and their role as parents and couples to walk together safely 
towards what God, our merciful Father, expects from them. We organize activities to help uh, divorced people in new units to uh, then uh, establish some contact with their parishes and continue to grow as God's family. We form life groups that are accompanied by a couple that acts uh, as a guide for them. And as soon as they embark upon this uh, path towards growth, we try to also assign them responsibilities, maybe take on activities of apostles in, the, in other apostles, in associations for the defense of life and the family, depending on their charisms. We also develop itineraries that are suggested by themselves. It could be catechesis, uh, biblical classes, uh, courses to uh, study uh, the, the church documents, such as Amoris Letizia, first and foremost, or also the Code of Canon Law, uh, the notion of uh, the nullity of marriage. We also address topics related to personal development that uh, promote self-knowledge, values. We favor the establishment of spaces for interpersonal communication so that different topics can be discussed. For instance, uh, marital issues, marital dialogue, uh, parent-child relationships, sexuality as a gift and challenge, forgiveness and reconciliation, our life of faith. So many issues that pertain to uh, marriage and the family. We also try to uh, provide training courses or formation courses to accompany couples who are going through hard times. And therefore, we try to provide a tangible service to accompany couples in their circumstances. We also try to work with other parishes in order uh, to uh, spread this uh, uh, pastoral initiative everywhere. Well, what have been the fruits of this uh, pastoral of hope? Well, we have saved several families who now feel part of the church. Now their children uh, are, go to catechism, they receive the sacraments, and they themselves are the best evangelizers quite often because with their testimony, they actually are able to win over uh, more souls uh, for God. And they are the key players of the extension or expansion towards the different parishes and dioceses of the country, because they have become instruments who are able to uh, share and, and communicate their experience also in other countries with excellent results. Since our foundation was established in 2006, uh, spiritual communion is spread in all the parishes in the country. Another thing that's very relevant is that several couples who have been part of the Pastoral de la Esperanza then found the courage to uh, then uh, apply for uh, the acknowledgement of the nullity of their marriage. Basically, they filed a petition to have their marriage declared null and void. And, and thus, they were able to uh, then receive the sacrament of marriage again. And some of them, we really have brought them to this, uh, to this goal that was uh, so important to them and to us. We too have learned so many things from them. Because after the conversion of a few couples, so maybe they had, uh, you know, uh, did not marry in the church. They just had a civil wedding many years back. And, uh, she, they told us that maybe they would not have separated the first time if they had uh, been helped in the way they have received help later on. And it's heartwarming to see uh, uh, their faith when they receive the Eucharist, and how they pray uh, for spiritual communion, and the faith with which they live the liturgy and the adoration, uh, really, the depth with which they experience all these things. It's uh, uh, something that uh, we we would like to imitate ourselves. And we have collected a few testimonies from uh, these people that we would like to summarize for your sake. So someone told us, after having uh, then embarked upon this path, we realized how uh, moving away from the church, how painful and how hurtful this has been. This is why we have decided to now devote our energies to the apostolate for this specific action. And, and other testimony, another witness st states that we realized that we needed to work together with other couples who were going through our same situation, other couples who taking part in these meetings because they were looking for spiritual accompaniment 
acompañamiento. De permanecer cerca de la fuente de gracias. Because we feel the need to uh, stay closer to the source of grace, uh, to uh, keep walking along the path of faith. Another witness states, God is love, and those who dwell in love dwell in God and God dwells in them. And other couples said, uh, we uh, consecrated uh, our souls to Mary as the mediator of all our spiritual needs. Almost immediately, feeling her unconditional love that was permeating our entire family. And our children are the ones who have benefited the most from this. Our children, when they received the Holy Communion, they said that they were doing this for us. It was a beautiful journey of love where everything seemed to fall into place. And in conclusion, we would like to remind you that in the Pastoral de la Esperanza, we have very much in mind what Pope Franz asked us. He asked us that, or he told us that it's better to have a church that, that suffers an accident by being in the street, moving and mobilizing society than a church that gets sick of uh, self-referentiality and of spiritual closure. With joy, therefore, uh, outgoing families. May uh, the uh, Holy Family of Nazareth bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Stella and Victor, for being so simple and wise in presenting spiritual accompaniment, especially for young couples. Alessandro and myself can really uh, testimony this. We uh, can be witness of the fact that our Father has been helping us and as accompanying us spiritually in our life. Uh, this is uh, uh, more challenging when uh, the two spouses are living in different uh, uh, type of relationship with God. Uh, they find themselves in a different stage. What happens when uh, a, um, a spouse is not uh, a believer? This is what uh, Agnes Sandra Vigante Taufik Hidayata, I hope I pronounced it well, will tell us about. Uh, they live in Indonesia and uh, uh, they are committed uh, to convey the faith to their children. You have the floor. Shalom. Good morning, dears and gentlemen. First of all, let us praise and thanks to the presence of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the abundance of grace and the joy that we can all gather in this place without any barrier in good health and in peace. Okay. In this occasion, let me be here to share the testimony of our family life experience with different belief. My name is Francisco Stofik, and the woman I love beside me is Agnes Sandra. We are from Indonesia. What I like most about Agnes is that it's, she is beautiful, cheerful, humble, loving, with a sense of humor, good cook, good wife and mother, and religious. Now I feel full of joy. <laughs> now I feel full of joy and bless as I have met the people here who have the spirit to spread Catholic values and believe through families. My name is Agnes Sandra Wigianti. We have been married for 21 years, and we have a doctor, Ardelia Tiffany, and son, Abelard Anugra. Yeah. 
What I like most about Taufik is that he is wise, that he is a servant, who puts his energy and mind at the surface of the happiness and well-being of his wife and children. My feeling now of gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ for his grace and for our family arrived here in good health and full of joy. I am too surprised, touched, happy, and excited here, accompanied by Taufik, to share God's goodness for all of us here. Before we got married, we went through a special relationship period for three years. In that time, we did not have much time to see each other face to face because we live for a way due to his job opportunity. At that time, we do not have much time to go deep, get to know, and understand each other's character. However, I felt that everything about her personality was good, even though I did not understand many things about her family. I knew she was Catholic and she was different from me, and yet I did not care. I believe that God gave me her love. I introduced her to my parents a year before we got married. They agreed that we should get married if she converted to Muslim religion because the Muslim doctrine did not allow me to marry a non-Muslim girl. Even some culture in our country believe that the interfaith marriage is something embracing and dishonor. Finally, Agnes converted to Islam and tried to practice Muslim value. I understood that it was not easy for her as she was a Catholic by birth. We were get married in mid of 2001 and stay away from our extended family. In our culture, getting married is not only the unity and intimacy of the couple, but it is the unity of two different family background, the unity of different rules, values, and cultures. At the beginning of this real life, we enjoy being together happily and charmingly, even though we stay in some more rented house and far away from our extended family. When I become a Muslim, I was honestly disappointed because I had to sacrifice myself to unify our love so that we could live together. Anyway, I work a Muslim for six years. I tried very hard to carry out Muslim worship. When I prayed, my heart and my mouth Pray the Our Father and Hail Mary only. My heart felt no peace, and I would pour out those emotions and my anger on our first doctor, who was five years old at the time. Even when I visited his extended family, I, ha I had to lie to not pray because I was unable to do so while I was lying. 
This moment tortured my mind, and I did not want to live in a family style. We did not accept the goodness of my parents, God, and our environment. Finally, I tried to be honest and had a dialogue with Taufik to give me permission to go to church. He allowed me to go back to church. And he and our doctor always accompanied me when I went to church. For six years, we lived away from our extended family, and I felt a pure love and heart without any outside intervention. I trusted that if we love each other, we need to sacrifice each other. I wanted a blessed marriage without him having to become Catholic. God is very good and opened Taufik mind so that he wanted to perform a Catholic dispensation marriage after attending a preparation for three months. After we got married with Catholic dispensation, my heart whispered to me that I must be honest with his family. I had to face the situation due to my return to the Catholic faith. It turned out that my parents-in-law were very sad to hear this situation. They were very disappointed and felt that I was playing games with the faith. I understood their feeling of sadness, but I stuck by my belief. At least I was already honest, and my parents-in-law already knew that my belief is Catholic. Therefore, I encountered it a slightly different attitude from them. In dealing with this situation, I fell under pressure, and my present, my parents even asked me to get a divorce. Also, they have kept this situation a secret so that other people would not judge it, especially if they are close to my parents. I think it has their feelings. I think it was the heaviest and most challenging stage of our life. I had to engage our mind and our feeling to avoid any conflict. I hope that no one would be hurt, especially my mother, my wife, and our children. And I had, and I had to make our family grow positively. This was very difficult for us, but it had to continue. We started limiting the time to talk about our faith when visiting my extended family. This was to avoid any questions about my family belief because I believe this was very sensitive and private. When my parents would ask me about this issue, I would give a floating answer to avoid asking any more questions. This situation went on until no one talked about it. This period too affected our life. I was worried that it would 
weaken our relationship if I did not set the priority. My priority was always our family and saving our blessed marriage and maintaining respect to my parents. This situation made my heart was becoming stronger to have the freedom to run my family life. I feel this is the starting point for us to work together to improve the relationship. I was proactive in searching for a Catholic retreat that couples of different faiths could attend. Finally, I found the Worldwide Married Encounter Weekend, according to information from the Married Encounter coordinated at our Paris. The weekend touched us techniques specifically intended to support and encourage an attitude of intimate and responsible living. We believe that marriage should be a deep source of joy and fidelity. Married life needs to be fine-tuned, reactivated, and rejuvenated to enhance life and grow together. Not least, the weekend has a Catholic ethos and it is open to couples of other faith or none. We do not find that the ethos a problem for them. At the weekend, we can also share and learn from the life experience of other couples which can strengthen our relationship and become a blessing to other couples. The weekend has opened my heart to see that most Catholic couples have something different from other couples of my belief. Catholic couples are more open-minded and this is a positive value for me. Also, most importantly, the weekend has made me see that my wife is a gift from God who is unique and accompanies me for life. Sharing during the family tree makes me love my spouse and my family more. I understand and ask and accept my wife's character more unconditionally. I enjoy during activities as a couple more. Our children always support us if we do activities as a couple. We like to walk hand in hand in public that I have never seen this in my parents. We have become more open to each other, but it does not mean there won't be more disappointment. But after we can, we can manage and communicate them better. I believe our children will see what we have done regarding marriage and make it a role model. Therefore, we apply what we have learned at the weekend in our life and make it a habit. Another value we have gained from Mary's encounter is the continuous prayer to wish our couple and our children God's goodness and grace. Since 2003, when I started accompanying my family to church and after gaining positive value from the weekend and other personal spiritual experience, I decided to convert my belief to Catholic 
in April 10, 2021, through the baptism. Currently, we are active in administration of the people in the parish in Paris. We are happy and joyful to serve people, especially single elderly people, because they need more attention and love. We believe that attention and love will give them zest of life and more a valuable life. Love will be more tolerant and break diversity. The weekend and the family are the peripheries of church that Pope Francis tells us about to spread that love of neighbor in a context of peace and love of God. We have lived 21 years of married life a harmonious life to continue to spread peace, love to serve each other in front of our children, even though our faith was different. During this period, Taufik has shown his extraordinary tolerance toward us. He followed the church worship even though he was a Muslim. In the last two years, he has diligently prayed the rosary. I have seen that little by little he has been changing. I believe this was an intervention of God. No words can express our joy and gratitude, but we present it with the act of accepting the test the Church has given us, and we are both happy to live it. Easter in this year has been an Easter that we have been able to celebrate together, as He has become a great Catholic father. Definitely, God's timing is the best. We love, we you. love you. We need, we need, you. need you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Grazie per il vostro intervento e per la vostra testimonianza. Concludiamo eh, ora il nostro percorso eh, parlando del perdono. Our journey talking about forgiveness as a way of holiness and where we will be doing so with uh, Danny and Laila Abdallah. I hope I did not mispronounce their name. They're uh, Catholic Maronites. They live sin in Sydney, in Australia. They're here with their entire family. They've been married since 2004, sorry, in Lebanon, and they are parents. Uh, this beautiful family that you can see here, their life testimony encourages every person to find freedom in forgiveness. Danny and Lila, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you. My name is Danny Abdallah. I'm from Sydney, Australia. I am very grateful to be here today. I'm the husband of a loving wife, 
Layla, who is standing beside me, and a proud father of seven children. Anthony, my best friend. Angelina, my little helper. Liana, my rock and my inspiration. Sienna, my cheeky little actress. Alex, who is my little man. And Michael, who has a heart of a lion. And we have a new addition, baby Selena, who is 12 weeks old. My wife and my kids are my reason for living. They are my purpose for waking up every day. Today is the eve of my son Anthony's birthday. In 2015, he was nine years old. He had a dream of Jesus. And Jesus asked him, Anthony, what do you want to be? In his dream, Anthony answered, I want to be a saint. Then Jesus replied, I will take you with me to heaven. I dismissed it as only a dream. But on the 1st of February 2020, Jesus fulfilled his promise. It was a perfect summer's day. Seven precious, adorable children took a walk to get some ice cream for my niece's 13th birthday. What should have been an innocent and enjoyable outing for the young kids turned into one of the worst road tragedies Australia has ever seen. The children were hit by a drunk and drug-affected driver who was driving in this quiet suburban street at 150 kilometres per hour, three times the legal speed limit. How can one car hit seven children? They couldn't have scripted this in a horror movie. I arrived on the scene. It was like entering the aftermath of a war zone. Four children dead. Their small, fragile, delicate bodies almost unrecognizable. Which child do I go to first? Along with my three children, Anthony, Angelina, and Sienna, their beautiful, loving cousin, Veronique Seika, was killed. My fourth child, Liana, witnessed everything. Another one of their cousins, Sharbul Kassas, suffered injuries so severe that he was placed in a coma for months. And his sister, Mabel, witnessed everything. Four lives lost. Three families shattered, an extended family devastated, a community in disbelief, and a nation in mourning. More police, paramedics, ambulance, and fire engines arrived. They put the crime scene tape up and pushed me out. From far away, I saw the police cover Anthony, Angelina, Sienna, and Veronique with a white sheet. They were gone. In my heart, I said to God, God, this is bigger than me. I surrender to you. I arrived soon after Danny to the place where four of my children had been hit. More than half my family it was horrific. People were screaming all around me, but I was calm. I started praying and asking people around me to pray because I believe God would perform a miracle. Nothing is impossible with Jesus. I was confident that he wouldn't harm my kids. Liana came to me bleeding. She needed to go to the hospital. I went with her in the ambulance 
still believing that the other children would join us. It wasn't until Danny arrived to the hospital with four of our Maronite priests that I realized three of my children had died. Anthony, Angelina, Sienna. I was crying, screaming, and begging for it not to be true. Two days later, when Liana went in for surgery, I went back to the scene. The place was covered in flowers. I knelt down at the place where each of the children laid after they had been hit and prayed, and our Father, Hail Mary, and the Fatima prayer. I prayed seven times, one for every child. I felt heavy, like I was walking down stations of the cross, and I saw Jesus on the cross. When the media approached me, they were speechless. What do you ask a mother who lost half her children in a blink of an eye? I spoke from my heart. I told them, Danny and I were blessed with seven children. They loved feeding the homeless at Team Jesus. We taught our kids to pray the rosary, to love each other, to read the Bible, to be kind. When I spoke about the driver, I said, I don't hate him. I think in my heart I forgive him, but I want the court to be fair. I didn't know the impact of these words. I believe the Holy Spirit moved my lips to speak words of forgiveness. The media asked me how people could help. I asked them to come and pray the stations of the cross at the site. Thousands showed up to pray that night. Then I asked them to pray the rosary and thousands came again the next night, and the night after that, every night until the funeral, and even after the funeral. The news reports became more about forgiveness and faith than they were about the tragedy. How can she forgive? Why would she forgive the man who hit seven kids? Why would she still have faith? How can she still love a God who has done this to her? Like Danny said, this was much bigger than us. I wasn't surprised that Layla chose to forgive so quickly. Anyone who knows Layla knows that she would choose forgiveness. We come from a large, extended, Lebanese, Maronite, Catholic family. The bigger the family, the bigger the problems. The greater the amount of love and forgiveness you need. Layla and I built our family on prayer. In the 18 years of our marriage, we have been consistently praying the Our Father asking God to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's a very powerful prayer, if you mean it. Friends, forgiveness is the path to holiness. Days before the accident, I had been walking along the beach with my son, Anthony. The school year was about to begin. As a father, I was worried about his choice of friends. I explained to him in detail that the daily choices he, ma he makes 
would determine the type of man he would become. I didn't realize at the time these words were for me. The day my children entered eternal life, I faced a choice. What path do I take? Do I take the path of construction or do I take the path of destruction? Do I seek to numb the pain with drugs and alcohol or do I choose to embrace this pain? This pain is unbearable. I've been carrying it since the day of the tragedy. I have sleepless nights and there are days when I feel hopeless. The choice I would make would not get rid of my pain, but it would determine where my family would be for the rest of their lives. We would either be stuck in the valley of pain and grief, or I could lead them to the high ground. I choose to forgive myself for telling my kids to go for a walk. I choose to forgive the offender in obedience to my Father in heaven. If my children were here today, they would say, Dad, forgive him. Jesus Christ, my mentor and my teacher, is the ultimate example of forgiveness. After getting beaten, spat on, and then hung on the cross, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. His blessed mother Mary watched her son suffer then chose to forgive the disciples for leaving him. I had heard the passion story so many times growing up, but it's only now, after such heavy grief, I understand its meaning. It all makes sense. In life, it's not if we suffer, but when we will suffer. I don't serve a God who tests me, I serve a God who has suffered greatly before me. The God we serve is a good father who says, let me go first. I will show you how to conduct yourself through the worst suffering imaginable. And the way through this is forgiveness. Forgiveness is more for the forgiver than the forgiven. When you forgive the other person, you start to heal. Forgiveness is not a single action in one moment. It has been more than two years, and I must choose to forgive myself and the driver every day to not retreat into hatred. The daily choice to forgive is not easy, but it is our path to holiness. I must ask God for forgiveness daily and keep forgiving so that my family will not be enslaved by the trauma of that night. If I have revenge, bitterness, anger in my soul, my kids will have the same because kids do what you do, not what you say. I realized that I had to do for them what God did for me. He showed me how to go through the worst type of suffering and still, still forgive those who did this to him. Danny and I stand here with a message for all of you. It is the core message of Christianity. It is the words Jesus spoke on the cross. It is forgiveness. Il perdono. Jesus asked us to forgive and explained why we should forgive for they do not know what they do. People are blinded by sin and their wrongdoing. Forgiveness is a choice you make, a choice to let go of anger and bitterness. There is power in forgiveness. There's freedom in forgiveness. Forgiveness is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. Forgiveness is a gift you give to yourself and to others. Forgiveness allows you to achieve greatness.
and leads you to holiness. Forgive so God can forgive you. My beautiful daughter Liana, my inspiration, reminds me that there is an I in forgive. It means it starts with each one of us. Be the initiative. and forgive unconditionally. I didn't have to wait for the driver to apologize or ask for forgiveness. I took the initiative. It started from my heart, spread to my family, our extended family, our local community, our country, and as we stand before you today, the whole world. Forgiveness allowed my marriage to survive. It taught Danny and I to look at each other in eyes of compassion and empathy. Forgiveness has begun the healing process in all of us. Our kids can look to the future. They can dream again. And most importantly, they still have faith in God. Liana was able to look at the driver with eyes of empathy and forgive him. Forgiveness has allowed the Abdallah, Saker, and Kassas families to unite and move forward with our pain and suffering. I would not have imagined that we would be in the Vatican on the eve of my son Anthony's 16th birthday to speak about forgiveness to the world. And from here, I would like to wish my son Anthony a happy heavenly 16th birthday. Anthony, I love you so much. I'm grateful to our Bishop Antoine Charbel Tarabai for giving us the opportunity to be here and supporting us on our journey. He nominated us to speak at this wonderful conference, World Meeting of Families 2022, but the Lord made it possible. The Lord never abandoned us. Through God's grace and mercy, we were able to forgive. Jesus asked us to forgive 70 times, seven times. Practice forgiveness daily. If you want to be able to forgive something big, start by forgiving yourself and your family. Seek God's mercy, love, and forgiveness of sins in confession. I'm not speaking from a place of perfection. I'm far from perfect. I'm here to serve the Lord. Are any of you perfect? None of us are perfect. Our kids were imperfect. The saints were imperfect either. But we are all called to be saints. God loves us with our imperfections. He is merciful. Forgiveness did not begin on the day our kids were taken away. 
and it did not end on the day we forgave the driver. It must be a regular part of the life of every Christian family. Forgiveness has brought us healing and peace. I am heartbroken, but I am at peace because honor my kids are in heaven. They are with Jesus. I am closest to my kids when I'm at Mass. When you are at your weakest, go to church and cry on Jesus' shoulder. Everyone has a cross to carry. We can't control what happened to us, but we can choose how to respond. Take control of your life. Repent, love, forgive, pray, confess, and be humble. This is our path to holiness. I look at faith like a spiritual bank account. Every good deed, every act of kindness, every prayer, every time you forgive, every time you, make, you love, you make a deposit. You do this so that on the darkest day of your life, when you have nothing to give, you can go to your faith account and call upon your good deeds. We pray that you never go through anything like the suffering or grief that we have been through. We hope that you will never have to forgive something so big. But you must prepare yourself for whatever suffering will come. If we can leave you with something today, it would be to encourage you to pray, practice forgiveness every day, and teach your kids to do the same. After every death, there is a resurrection. And Leila and I have been privileged to hear from many people in Australia who have forgiven and been reconciled since hearing our story. In memory of our kids, the little saints, we turned this tragedy into a day of forgiveness. Leila and I have created an I Forgive Day on the anniversary of the tragedy in which is held on the 1st of February each year. This day has been endorsed by the Australian government and is now recognised as a National Day of Forgiveness. We hope to bring I Forgive Day to our motherland, Lebanon, the Middle East, and then the whole world. People are yearning for forgiveness and are beginning to understand the freedom it brings. It's not just a message for Catholics or Christians. It is for the whole world. It is a message for all humanity. It is a path not only to holiness, but to freedom. And now I turn to you, Lord Jesus. You taught us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And only then you will become sons and daughters of your Father who is in heaven. Please, Lord, help Layla, myself, and all of us here to continue the journey of forgiveness. Thank you very much. You can hear the standing ovation for Daniel and Leila Abdullah's 
very moving intervention and address speaking of forgiveness as the way to holiness. Certainly one of the high points of the world meaning of families uh, up to this point. Bene. Ancora grazie. Thank you again for this incredible, incredible and courageous uh, uh, testimony that shows uh, how holiness uh, is nested in each family. We take uh, a short break, 15 minutes. We, uh, for some refreshment after the last panel that we're going to have uh, in a while. So enjoy your break. And as you heard, there is a brief pause in the events of this morning as uh, 